This is Alameda, California, a pleasant East Bay City alongside Oakland and San Leandro across the bay from San Francisco. This island community is home to some 77,000 people, and to look at it today, one would think Alameda has always stayed the same, a quiet and secure place of tree-lined streets and comfortable homes. But this is not the case. For over the past 200 years, Alameda has gone through a great many changes. For one thing, Alameda at first wasn't even an island, but a peninsula joined to the mainland at its eastern end by a strip of tidal marsh. For thousands of years, Indians made their homes here. They had deer and elk and many other animals caught fish with handmade nets, and gathered the acorns from the vast stands of oak trees which grew everywhere. The Indians also collected shellfish from the shores and tossed the empty clam and oyster shells onto enormous heaps. Over the estimated 3,500 years they lived here, these shell mounds grew quite large, and in modern-day Lincoln Park stands a plaque showing where one of these shell mounds used to be one that measured 400 feet long by 150 feet wide and stood 14 feet tall. In 1820, Alameda became the property of one man, retired Spanish Army officer Luis Peralta, who handed it down to his sons. Alameda Historical Museum curator, George Gunn. Alameda was uh, once a part of a Spanish land grant. It was awarded uh, the Peralta family for serving the uh, crown or the king of Spain. And uh, two Yankees came along, settled in San Francisco, came across uh, the San Francisco Bay, saw Alameda, thought it was perfect for their uh, endeavors. The city was founded by two gentlemen, W.W. W. Chipman and Gideon Augenbaugh. And we have several portraits that have survived of Chipman. However, there's no surviving portrait or photograph of Gideon Augenbaugh, his co-partner. Chipman and Augenbaugh's original plan was to, of course, create a city of Alameda. But they came here with the idea of planting fruit trees uh, in developing produce for the busy markets of San Francisco. You have to remember that it was during the gold rush. The two partners never realized their dream, for their lands were stolen from them by hordes of squatters who poured into California in great numbers during those times. Alameda was divided into three separate townships. Woodstock on the western end of the peninsula, Encinal at about midpoint, and the town of Alameda at the eastern end. During the 1860s, the railroads came, and along with the establishment of regular ferry boat service to San Francisco, Alameda became the commuter town that it is to this day. The three townships were incorporated into a single town, Alameda, in 1872. More and more people came to Alameda to settle, and the new city grew rapidly. They came from all over, Yankees from New England first, followed by Chileans, French, Irish, and Italians. A wave of Germans arrived starting in 1875, and the Chinese at about the same time. African Americans came to Alameda and built their homes here as well. And finally came the Japanese during the mid-1890s. From the beginning, Alameda welcomed newcomers from all over the world, and this diversity has made Alameda the vibrant place that it is today. Between 1876 and 1877, the Alameda Fire Department, Police Department, and Board of Education were founded. The Bureau of Electricity followed in 1887, as did telephones that same year.
The 1890s were a time of widespread growth and development for Alameda. Some 305 buildings were constructed in the year 1890 alone. Many of these, built in the Victorian style, are still standing today, giving much of Alameda its distinctive 1890s atmosphere. By the turn of the century, many improvements were underway throughout Alameda. The Carnegie Library began construction in 1902 and was completed the following year. This year, 1902, was a special year in Alameda's history, for it was then that Alameda became an island with the opening of the Tidal Canal separating the town from neighboring Oakland. The canal evolved as a solution to problems with sewage and navigation and enhanced the already booming shipping industry. The Alaska Packers Fleet was a common sight on Alameda's busy waterfront. By 1909, electricity powered public streetcars and lit the streets by night. And at about this time, the elected offices of the mayor and city council were instituted. The 1920s were boom times for Alameda. This was the era of Alameda as a resort for the well-to-do citizens of the Bay Area who berthed their yachts along the shoreline and played in the sands beside the San Francisco Bay. Marge Fraley recalls these memorable days. Sunny Cove Beach was called in the early days Sunny Cove Baths because it was more of a bath with hot salt water baths as well as the bathing beach and the swimming, well the swimming pool wasn't built until 1917. Before that it was just the um, surf. Well we had um, Jack LaLanne and many muscle men hung out at the beach and we had, they had um, bars to do their, their pull-ups or whatever with and, uh, and Ed Yarrick, he was very popular then too. He was a taller fellow than Jack. Jack had a beautiful voice and, and he would sing when he was dressing. We could hear him all over the beach. It was, and he, we had stairs that uh, went from the ground level down to the beach level and he'd walk down on his hands. It was about 15 or 18 stairs, I guess. And that was an interesting crowd always. And there was boys and there were girls, just like there are now. <laughs> and uh, families also. And many came from uh, uh, their early age, like Bill Godfrey and his family. Uh, in case you don't know, Bill Godfrey is, and his father also were mayor of uh, Alameda at one period. And the high school swim team used to work out at our pool. Uh, of course, the, the city didn't have any pools then. Another popular spot was Neptune Beach at the foot of what is now Webster Street. and luxury hotels drew visitors from San Francisco and beyond, seeking a relaxing holiday on the sunnier side of the bay. One of Alameda's treasures is the Alameda Theater, Built in 1931 by the architect who also created Oakland's Paramount Theater, the Alameda Theater today stands as a monument to those exciting times when Hollywood was in full bloom. 
One famous Alamedan was Robert L. Lippert, an entrepreneur-producer who in his day made a great number of films in Hollywood. His body of work included such successful films as Steel Helmet and The Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price. Lippert was recognized and honored by his peers in the movie industry. Andy Pagano worked in the theaters of Alameda as a young man. The first movie that they showed was Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. I still remember that. That was a beautiful theater built by the same people who both built the Paramount in Oakland. And that was a very successful theater for many, many years. The Vogue came a little later on. Before that, there was many other theaters that, I, that was a little bit before my time. I was hired uh, by the theater owner of the Lincoln Avenue uh, Theater called the Lincoln Theater, right between Bay and, and Sherman on 1200 block of Lincoln. I got uh, the job of being doorman. And then the place was sold to Bob Lippert, Robert Lippert, who was, became a, a Hollywood legend, uh, made many motion pictures. Uh, but before that, he, uh, he owned uh, Alameda. The Lincoln was his first theater, and I went along with the theater, so I worked for Mr. Lippert for quite a few years. Mr. Lippert at that time was in the show business of road showing, showing movies to uh, faraway places. At that time, it looked like faraway places, like Lake County and uh, Merced and, and uh, uh, Paso Robles and all the ch churches and schools, it's not only in Alameda, but all over. And I was his right-hand man, uh, along with a couple other fellows. And we traveled and set up movie equipment, some of the first sound equipment on discs yet, uh, much, much uh, earlier than the sound on film. And it was quite a kick uh, showing movies for the first time, sound movies for the first time in some of these schools and churches. Uh, the kids would run behind the screen to see who was talking because they had never heard a sound picture before. He made so quite a few films for the Fox Company in, in, um, in England. And most of his films were B films. And he was the first one, by the way, to, to release films, as far as I know. I can remember when we first had an old black and white set. Uh, every other movie, that, practically every movie that came on was a Robert L. Lippert production. He used to make these B movies and he made quite a bit of money. His primary business was movies, That's, that was it. He just loved to make movies and be a part of it. His whole life was spent around making motion pictures and, and showing them. The practice of using landfill to reclaim former wetland areas has made the Alameda of today about two and a half times larger than the Alameda of 1850. In 1936, the people of Alameda voted to give the western end of the island to the federal government for use as a naval air base. And on November 1, 1940, the base was commissioned and began operations. When the United States entered the Second World War in December 1941, the Alameda base became an important strategic staging site for men and material bound for the Pacific Theater. The sudden influx of up to 100,000 sailors, marines, and airmen brought far-reaching changes to Alameda as the flood of servicemen and their families boosted the local economy. The base was the point of debarkation for the historic Doolittle Raid on Japan. Led by Alamedan Jimmy Doolittle, the raid accomplished little destruction, but provided a badly needed boost of morale to the American people during the dark days in the wake of Pearl Harbor. The post-war period of the 1950s and 60s brought much new development to Alameda, just as it did to the rest of the Bay Area. The landfills increased, and sadly, many of Alameda's charming older buildings were torn down to make way for the new tract homes and apartment complexes and a whole new section of Alameda, South Shore. A longtime Alameda resident, Archie Waterbury. The nature of the population changed, of course, at the time. We were all Pacific Coasters. I am a native son, and the percentage of native 
sons in the town was probably quite high. And then all of the people were imported to work in when most of them stayed. Housing projects were built. I don't know how many, but at least a half a dozen. The largest, if I remember, the estuary project had some 1,200 units. Because the war, and most of them lived in the war housing, and because those buildings were destroyed not too long after the war, most of the people left but not all. Alameda went up to a population of 90 some odd thousand and then shrunk back to 70,000. But uh, the change had been made. Oh, I would guess in many classes, social class, educational level, and so on. Bay Farm Island, at the eastern end of Alameda, remained largely untouched in its agricultural state until the mid-1970s. By then, the growing housing needs of the Bay Area made it a choice target for development. But thanks to the city's policies of managed growth, Bay Farm Island escaped the congestion of high-rise apartment complexes and retained much of its rural character. New homes here are built amidst open parkland and bicycle paths, creating a green and pleasant environment for the residents. The 1970s saw the birth of the Victorian Society, an organization dedicated to the preservation of Alameda's Victorian heritage. This was the beginning of a sort of minor renaissance in which the beautiful and gracious homes of the past were restored and cherished. Another such organization is the Alameda Historical Museum. The uh, Historical Society was founded by a group of uh, descendants of pioneer families that thought that the history of Alameda and objects pertaining to it should be preserved for the public. Uh, this is the only vehicle for showing the history of Alameda through tangible objects. The objects in the museum are a link from the past to the present. It gives one an idea of the stability of the community when you come in here, look at the collection and see that there was a history before we came here. In this way, a part of Alameda's past has been preserved for the enjoyment of future generations, relics of a gentler and simpler time. While Alameda moves from this century into the next, many more changes will surely take place. But the people of Alameda are committed to keeping their city the safe, pleasant place to live that it is today.